It's Kate, and this is the third video for week five of Math 23. Next up, we're going to talk a little bit more about quantifiers and negation. We've actually been using quantifiers for a bit of the semester already, but now we're really going to get into proving some major axioms. Obviously, we've already done that a bit with linear algebra, but in analysis, proofs are sort of the heart of what we're going to be going after. So being able to express particular statements or facts or truths as well as the negation of statements is a really important skill that you should definitely learn how to do. Ross doesn't really tend to use quantifiers very often, but when you're doing your problem set, you'll certainly find them useful and we'll be writing problem set questions as well as quiz questions and section problem questions uh, frequently using this type of terminology. This backwards E, as we've discussed, is there exists. It's usually followed by such that, or ST. There exists some blank such that. Here's an example. There exists an X such that X squared equals 4. It's true since either 2 or negative 2 has the desired property. This upside down A is read for all, or for each, or for every, whichever uh, you prefer when you're reading over the sentence. It should make grammatical or contextual sense to you. It's used to specify that some proposition is true for every single member of a possibly infinite set or sequence, which we'll get into what a sequence is. But here's an example where we say, for all x in the real numbers, x squared is greater than or equal to zero. That's true. But for all x in the real numbers, x squared is greater than zero is false because x could be equal to zero. How do we negate things? Well, when we negate things, two things need to happen. First, we need to swap the quantifiers. Every time you see a for all, that should turn into a there exists, and every time you see a there exists, that turns into a for all. And that's followed by a negation of the statement. So the original statement here being, there exists x such that p of x is true. Then we change the there exists for a for all. So we say for all x, and we get rid of the such that, that generally so that the statement reads correctly in a grammatical sense. So we have such that p of x is true turns into p of x is false. So we can see that there exists x such that p of x is true. The opposite of that would be saying for all x p of x is false. Here's another example. This one here says for all x p of x is true. Well, the first thing we want to do is take that for all x and convert it to there exists x. And then the statement that follows p of x is true is negated with such that p of x is false. That's such that is inserted again for the sentence to make grammatical sense. You'll get a lot of practice negating various statements using quantifiers in section as well as the sample problems and on your problem set. Our major focus for a lot of our proofs and much of our work is going to be on sequences and their limits. Well, first of all, what is a sequence? Here it says a sequence is really a function whose domain is a subset um, n greater than or equal to m of the integers. But usually we basically just start with 0 or 1, and n starts at 1 and goes to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and whose codomain in this module is in R. So basically n is like an index number starting at 0 or 1, and then the output is just a number. Sequences are basically an ordered list where it's written just like this. Each member of the domain, one, two, three, four, maps to a particular element in the sequence. So S1 is just the term that starts off the sequence. Then S2 is the second term in the list. And S3 is the third term and S4 is the fourth term and so on and so forth where all the index numbers, s sub 1, s sub 2, s sub 3, sub 4, sub 5, sub 6, all the index numbers are natural numbers. It's like a serial number. It's literally like a grocery list where we have 1 is eggs, 2 is bread, whatever. You get the metaphor. But that's exactly what a sequence is. It is an ordered list of numbers. Usually, you'll even get a recipe for how to calculate 
the nth element of a sequence. But the point is, is that a sequence is infinite. It is an infinite list, an ordered list. It matters what order they go in. And this is how we write them. Ross uses these uh, parentheses in here. Sometimes it looks like this, where it says S sub N, denote, saying specifically that these index uh, values are members of the natural numbers, or even just like this. That is how we write a sequence. And although a sequence is infinite, the set of values in the sequence can itself be finite. They don't have to increase, increase, increase. They don't have to follow any particular pattern really for any sequence, but sometimes you can define how to find what the nth term is in this list. So here you have an example where S sub n is equal to cosine of n pi. And so since cosine is bounded by negative one and one, this entire sequence, the set of the values, because they're multiples of pi here, just are negative one and one, going back and forth forever. But again, bounded. Now when we talk about the limit of a sequence, this refers to what this these numbers are approaching as the index is getting higher and higher and higher. So we want to see what the limit of this list is as n becomes very large. Um, it's unambiguous to write it like this because it's quite obvious that the only thing we care about is what happens when n gets large. This is sort of redundant, but it contains plenty of information so you can write either of these. The limit of the sequence as n goes to infinity is quite clear here, but that is what this also means. And what it means for a sequence to converge is extremely important. This is one of those definitions that you just have to learn. Let's highlight it. Now on first pass, this is not going to make any sense, but let's go back and talk about it. It says, for all epsilon greater than zero, Epsilon is a real number. That's all that means. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N that is a member of the natural numbers such that for all little n greater than capital N, the distance between S sub n and S is less than epsilon. And what this means is that this sequence S sub n converges to S. Now, if I were going to explain this with almost no mathematical terms at all, what would this really mean? Well, when we say for all epsilon greater than zero, this is really only a challenge for teeny tiny numbers. Like, no matter what value you give me, as long as it's greater than zero, no matter how small, one millionth, one billionth, one trillionth, there exists some index that I can point to in my sequence. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's 20, maybe it's 100, such that I can say, look, for all the other terms beyond that in the sequence, they're always within a millionth of the limit, s, some particular value s. I'm gonna say that one more time. No matter how small of a value you challenge me with, I can always point to a place in the sequence, capital N is that index, and say, for every single term beyond the capital nth term, I'm going to be within that teeny tiny distance from the limit. And this is pretty incredible. That is what convergence really means. Most of the time when you have a recipe for how to pick or how to construct S sub n and you're given what your limit is, you can actually figure out based on the epsilon given to you exactly what that capital N, the index should be so that from that point onwards, you're within epsilon of the limit. We'll do a couple examples like that in class. It's also important to note that if the limit of a sequence exists, it is unique. We will be doing that in class as well. It's a wonderful application of the triangle inequality and involves one of the uh, very common proof strategies that you'll be doing. A formal proof should be as concise as possible. This is a little bit of a note about people writing proofs for the first time. So it should be as concise as possible while omitting nothing that is essential. Um, sometimes it obscures the chain of thought that led to the invention of the proof. I like that it says formal proofs are nice and you should learn how to write them. He has six examples in section eight and six more in section nine. But if your goal is to convince or instruct the reader, 
you'll need a longer version of the proof uh, and that's going to be more preferable. Basically what we're saying is on your homework, try not to do the formal proof style where you have it is as concise as possible with only uh, justification where you need it. Show us your thought process. Justify every line. If you make an interesting choice, be clear about it, but don't be so concerned about being super, super concise. Obviously, you don't want to be circular. You don't want to be redundant, but uh, we appreciate that effort, but it's much more illustrative for you to explain your thought process to us, at least in the beginning.